welcome to the second segment here on High Heat on the Internet. It's nice to have you with us as we talk to you on this second day of April. It's good to have you aboard. Lots to do here because there you see him. He's our good buddy, Joe Buck. He's going to be our segment guest here today as we say hello to the voice of Major League Baseball, who's in St. Louis with a couple of two-year-olds. Kids back from college in the whole nine yards. Joseph, nice to talk. How are you today, Pat? Okay. Yeah, good. Every, you know, uh, relatively speaking, uh, you're right. My my girls uh, who are 23 and 20, the 23 year olds back from New York, the 20 year olds back from LA and USC, and the two year olds are going nowhere. So uh, we are all inside our house. And I saw somebody post something today, and it could not be more appropriate. Uh, somebody saying, if I hear one more person say, I'm so bored. I'm just going to lose it because thank God, you know, at least in this house, to this point, we're bored. We're not running to the hospital. We're not, you know, I'm not a healthcare worker. I, I just can't imagine what every day is like on the front lines of this thing. So it's nice to be able to talk to you. It's good to see your face. It's good to watch you do your and. Uh, right. Nice. And uh, I love you, buddy. And yeah, who knows where this thing is headed, but we'll all get through this somehow together. Uh, we got a lot to do here in a short amount of time. The first thing I'm going to do is the other day, uh, MLB Radio Network is putting a list of games together that are going to air. And so I have promoted it on Tuesday. And lo and behold, I could not believe that they were doing an Indian Roy A's game in 1960. I said, Indy, what, what was so significant? You know, Game 752 World Series, it's famous games, but I couldn't figure out why the Indians stay. So I made a call this morning to find out. And you know why? They are listing the famous voices in the sport and using their play-by-play -play calls who, or, and their game broadcasts. And who in 1960, on April 23rd, in Kansas City, who did the game? Your dad and Carl Erskine. Wow. In 1960, Indians and A's. I bet you you don't even have a copy of that, correct? I, heck no. No. Uh, it's, it's funny, you know, you bring that up because this last year, uh, at the end of the AFC Championship game, Jim Nance kind of handed the baton to us at Fox as we were going to do the Super Bowl uh, that was coming up in Miami, and the Chiefs had stamped their ticket, and we were waiting to see who they were going to play because our game was up next. And uh, he mentioned that my dad called that Super Bowl four, I guess it was. Yes. Uh, yes. And I didn't even know it. So I, I found out information, leave it to Jim Nance to know more about my dad than I did, uh, that that was the only one that he did on TV. So then I went back and I watched all of that kind of leading into doing the, uh, the Chiefs and the 49ers this past February. And it was cool. So hearing that stuff, and I just got a book sent to me by Carl Erskine uh, with a great note inside, and uh, it means the world to me. And I'm, I, believe me, I've got time now to dig into it. So uh, it's funny to hear these stories kind of come out now and go back and see some of the stuff that my dad did that I literally had no idea he was even a part of. I was fortunate because we did all these hot, start, or hot starts on baseball on radio uh, last week, and I gambled and I put Erskine on, 10-0 Dodgers in 55. He was sharp as a tack. And he faced DiMaggio in the 49 World Series in the sixth inning at Yankee Stadium. And he popped him up and he realized that. And the other thing he told me that was fascinating, he says, remember, Chris, I have rings from both Dodger teams on both coasts. So he's got the 55 ring, which he has not sold, which P.V. Reese did. And he's got the 59 ring because he was on the Dodger team in 59, pitched a little bit when they beat the White Sox. And then the next year, I, I guess, I don't know, he must have been hired by somebody to be a baseball analyst, and he hooked up with your father with the Indians and A's. I could not believe it. So it's a small world with Carl Erskine and, and Jack Buck. How about that? Huh? Yeah, I mean, my dad got to work with some, I mean, fantastic players and great people. He did games with Sparky Anderson for a while. He did games with Bill White uh, for a long time. They were great friends. He did games with Johnny Bench. I mean, they're – you know, for, on the radio side, they can take a few more chances and they can put some guys uh, into the broadcast booth that right. maybe are, are current players. And there were times where that happened. So he became, you know, I, this is self-serving, but I think if you spent four hours with my dad on the air and you were new to broadcasting, I'm sure my dad was, was giving these people all he had 
with regard to knowledge of how to do the games. He was a great guy. He was a funny guy. And he ended up being friends with these people uh, for the rest of his life. So, yeah, I, I'm lucky. It's another way that I'm lucky that I get to follow him into this business for people really from the golden age of baseball. Chris, you're, you're uh, you know, a half generation or whatever older than, than I am. And you saw baseball when I wish I had been able to. I wish I had lived through the 60s and seen the game, I think, when it was at its best in some ways. And some of the all-time greats played then. And uh, I just missed all that. So I, I got to know them all as kind of older guys that were hanging around with my dad. But I, I wish I had seen them play. And obviously, Joe was uh, – Jack Buck was superb working with uh, getting the best out of a young analyst, so I'm sure that worked there in 60. All right, a couple of things here on some other sports. One, Brady goes to the NFC, goes to Tampa. Now, I know there's cross-flexing, and that's fortunate. We hope we have some football. But that will help Fox because you'll do a lot of – you know, the Chiefs play – no, that's an AFC game. But, I mean, Green Bay and Minnesota, uh, yeah. the Rams, they all go to Tampa this year, and you probably will spend a lot of time. You haven't been in Tampa to do a game probably forever. You'll be in Tampa a lot in the fall if we're so lucky to do a lot of Brady games. How about that for a yeah, second? Yeah, I know. I agree with everything you said. I can't tell you, honestly, the last time I was in Tampa, and I was born in St. Pete because uh, I was born at the end of April, the end of spring training when the Cardinals and Mets used to train together at Allang Stadium. So that's my kind of hometown area, and I can't tell you the last time that I was in Tampa for a game. I, you're right. We're going to be there a lot. It's kind of, that was a Christmas present I didn't see coming uh, a couple of weeks ago when he signed on with the Bucks. And, you know, they're loaded. You can say what you want. First of all, they got a really smart, creative head coach that's offensive-minded in Arians. They've got weapons. He's going to have more weapons, I think, than he's ever had. Uh, I agree. To, to use, be good. you know, with a big receiver in Evans, with Godwin, who's a stud, with a good running back, with two good tight ends. I mean, he's not had this. Really, even in his heyday, and at the height of his powers in New England, and uh, a pretty good defense. So, you know, it's weird because there, there have been games uh, that we've had in NFC Champ games where we'll see Atlanta, and it's like, man, we haven't seen these guys all year. And they're in the NFC Championship game because it's NFC South. And we either go up east or you go to Green Bay or you go to Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. Now we're going to be in the South, and, and I can see with that division being as exciting as it is uh, with, with what even New Orleans did. And Carolina is different, and Atlanta's made some big changes. I think we're going to be there a lot. So this is this, you know, like you said, God willing, if we're playing, uh, this could be a much different feeling season for us, uh, our 19th year together, Troy and me. All right, now, the U.S. Open Golf postponed. Do you think we'll be fortunate to have this tournament this year, or do you think it might go the way of Wimbledon and, you know, we don't probably the British Open and be canceled because the calendar gets tight? What's your take on right. that? I think they're going to try like hell to get it in. Um, obviously, the best case would be a wing foot. You know, the, the, the membership there – the, the work that's been done on the golf course, the preparations, well, all that had to stop. And uh, I, I think then you start looking at the schedule, and if you had to push it way back, then you worry about weather and you worry about cold and all that. So I think it's either going to be, I, you know, in a perfect world, it's at Wingfoot a bit later in the calendar. Uh, another option is taking it out to the West Coast and having some of those rounds be in prime time and have it back at a Pebble Beach or someplace where it's just kind of U.S. Open ready uh, all year round, or you don't have it. I don't know. You know, that's the thing. I, I've talked to my bosses at Fox. You know, you talk to the President of the United States. Nobody knows where this thing is headed. It certainly feels a hell of a lot more serious than it did, at least to me, a month ago. Yeah. So, you know, we have to get to the other side of this, see where we are, and then, you know, hopefully the sport that's near and dear to our hearts is playing by July, but, you know, that, that seems like that's iffy, too, at this point. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, the forecasting's impossible. I'll tell you one thing I can see, uh, based even in the last couple of days, I, for the NBA and baseball, I can see empty stadium stuff. Um, I can see, you know, uh, players, teams playing, but I can see empty stadiums and arenas uh, for the foreseeable, once they, if they do begin, for the foreseeable future. What's your take on that? Yeah, I agree. I, I think that's probably and, – and I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I think we'll 
my feelings on this change by the hour, I feel like. So to, to project how we're all going to feel come mid to end of June, mid July, I don't know. I, we, this is uncharted waters for all of us, but I, I'm with you, you know, seeing fans file in, sitting, you know, body to body, uh, this close to, uh, to when the outbreak has happened with this virus. I'm with you. I, I think these sports will try like heck to get them back up and going. And I think at the beginning of this process, I think it will be empty stadiums. In fact, I'd take that right now. If you said, hey, they're playing oh, I would in July. Too. Yes. They're, they're playing an all-star game at Dodger Stadium in July, and you've got half a season, and the only way to do it is with empty stadiums and just guys playing on the field and support staff and everybody's, you know, checked and whatever. Take it and run. I uh, 100%. I could see an all-star game starting the, um, the whole process like they did in 81 when they had it in Cleveland after that 50-day scenario there, the, the lockout strike. I could see them trying to do that. I, you know they want to save the All-Star game and put it in a situation where we can still have that to sort of begin a season. Can't you see that, Joe? I do. Um, it's, it's easily the best All-Star game of, of the four major sports. There's easily. just absolutely no question about that, whether it counts or it doesn't count. Uh, it's still the best. And it'd be a hell of a way to start the year. And, and I also think this, you know, they floated those ideas of expanded playoffs and do it. And whatever. I think this is an opportunity. This you can look at this as a real opportunity for Major League Baseball and Rob Manfred. If he wants to come in and go, look, 2020 is a different year than we've ever had, and we're going to try some different stuff. We're going to expand the playoffs. Where you know you pick your opponent, whatever they want to do, uh, pitch clocks, whatever. I mean, I think everything's on the board. I hope so, because if there's ever a time to try stuff, Experiment. it's in 2020. See what works. It freaks people out, see what people take to, and they go, oh, you know what? I, I wasn't sure about that, but I kind of like it, and it stays in going forward. Uh, I think this is an opportunity along those lines. 100%. Uh, let's do something now you historically. 96, your first World Series uh, for Fox in 2001. We're doing game seven here on the network, basically all day today, that classic in Arizona with the backdrop of 9-11, and, of course, that great game seven. Uh, where the Yankees had the lead with the Soriano home run. And then here comes, of course, uh, the Diamondbacks in the eighth and ninth against the great Mariano. The one thing that was interesting, I didn't realize, I get barely a cop here this today. You know, Randy Johnson, in game six the night before, Joe, threw 105 pitches, and it was basically 10 nothing in the fifth inning. Uh, and Brenly left him in there to pitch like seven or eight innings in the game. And then he went back to him the following day, which was significant. So that is interesting that he pitched him with such a big lead. And those games in Arizona and game seven specifically was one of the all-time great games. And you had it in November uh, right after 9-11. Give me your thought. And your fifth year as the voice of baseball. Give me your thoughts on that. Go ahead. Yeah, it was uh... – Man, that was emotional, and it was strange. I remember going into Yankee Stadium, and everybody kind of felt vulnerable. Then he got in there after getting through security, and I remember sitting in the booth going, I am literally sitting in the safest place on the face of the earth. Yes, you are. In the Bronx. Uh, you know, game three, that's when President Bush walked out, gave the thumbs up, threw a strike. I mean, a seed from the mound with a bulletproof vest under his coat, and – I mean, it's just surreal thinking back on all that. Then you have the Yankees coming back, uh, getting that series back out to Arizona up when it looked like they were dead in the water. And then you got Arizona winning game six. And then that game seven provided, I think, the best analytical moment I've ever heard, let alone sat next to when the game's on the line. Gonzalez is up. Mariano Rivera has been nothing but perfect, you know, before and after closing out big games in October and the best I've ever seen at closing a game. And uh, Tim says, you know, the, the real danger when you bring the infield in with Rivera is he gets a lot of balls off the handle of the bat and you get a lot of flares against him. And there's now a lot of room between the infield and the outfield. And I, on the next pitch, I believe Luis Gonzalez jam shots one over the head uh, of the infielders, I think on the left side, like over Jeter ish. Jeter's spot and and down into the outfield and the World Series ended. I looked at Tim like, man, that's a great quarter. When you look forward, 
you know, it's how Romo's made $9 billion uh, in the NFL predicting what's going to happen. But to do it in that, it's one thing to see a defensive coverage and whatever, but with the pitch and what has to happen at the plate and then where the infielders are, that's as good as it gets. I, I was just like, wow, man, that, you just won an Emmy. And I tell you, speaking of baseball and speaking of uh, breaks, how about Houston? They got the break. Of, I hate to use it as a break, but nobody is going to get annoyed about the Astros anymore after this disaster with this virus. If they ever reach, when we restart, and you know, whenever that might be, you won't see as much fire against the Astros as you normally would. Yeah. People, people will forget. People will forget. And I think the Astros... Well, there may be will, nobody there. There may be playing in an empty stadium. Point. It'd be up to the other dugout to boo them. Yeah. <laughs> and I think actually, and I, I think that'll actually probably help the Astros I, because that now is over. I think you'd generally agree the Astros sign-stealing thing effectively is over with coronavirus. Don't you agree? I mean, a lot of things are, I don't know how you feel, but I mean, the minutia and the stuff that we all worry about every day and you flip on the, the news and I mean, you're seeing, you know, Fountains of Wayne is, is a band that I've loved for a long time. Uh, I guess, is it Wayne, New Jersey? Is, is that the town in Jersey? Yeah, Wayne, New Jersey. Yep. The, the lead singer's 52. I'm about to turn 51. He just died with coronavirus. And, and it, you start to, you know, obviously there's, there's, thousands upon thousands of stories we're, we're talking about sign stealing with the Astros is something that you know you and I could probably do a seminar on and I I have a tough time believing they're the only team or the Red Sox or there's two guys that have figured this out with as much player movement as there is if there's only one team stealing signs electronically or, or banging on trash cans or whatever that that's a hard sell for me so I yeah, move on. We've got bigger things to worry about. And, uh, man, when that you hear that first crack of the bat, that's going to be a really welcome sound and make us all re realize that maybe we're on, you know, the road back to some sort of normalcy. And uh, the first game you have, if it is in L.A. in an all-star game scenario, you will welcome back America to baseball. Joe, stay healthy. Thanks for uh, getting with us here today. Uh, we'll keep in touch. Appreciate you giving us a few minutes. Yeah, of course. Anything for you, Chris. You stay healthy and uh, hug uh, that beautiful family of yours. All right, very good. Our good buddy is Mr. Joe Buck. Great to have him with us here on this uh, little segment here on High Heat. Now, we were with you again on Tuesday. Uh, so you watched this Yankee Diamondback game that Joe, of course, called with McCarver. It's one of the old-time classics in that seventh game and uh, the Bob out there at the time in Arizona. Good job out of Moses today. Good job out of Rich Savino today. And we'll see you early next week.